The true birthplace of world civilization can be attributed to Mesopotamia, also known as the land of the two rivers. The Sumerians were a remarkable civilization that excelled in various fields. They were skilled shipbuilders, advanced in astronomy, and experts in constructing irrigation canals that facilitated agriculture. Among their notable achievements, they can proudly claim the invention of beer. However, it is worth noting that historical evidence suggests that the ancient Sumerians embraced a more permissive lifestyle. Furthermore, when the city of Babylon is mentioned, one often associates it with the infamous figure of the Whore of Babylon. Let us journey back in time to Mesopotamia and explore the intriguing lives of Sumerian priestesses. Herodotus stands out as one of the earliest to describe the rituals of temple prostitution in Mesopotamia. References to such practices can also be found in the Bible, leading many modern scholars to believe in their existence. To embark on a brief historical journey, prior to the 22nd century BC, Mesopotamia consisted of several prominent city-states, each with its own rulers, laws, and distinct religious practices. These cities engaged in conflicts, vying for control over new territories, rivers, and smaller settlements. This era persisted until the rise of Sargon of Akkad, who became the ruler to unify northern and southern Mesopotamia, effectively establishing the world's first empire. It is widely believed that Sargon not only solidified existing traditions of temple prostitution, but also played a significant role in their development. Sargon was a trailblazer in his time, as he was the first ruler to appoint his daughter, in Heduana, as the high priestess of the cult of Nanu, the god of the moon. This act initiated a tradition where rulers would appoint their daughters as high priestesses to consolidate their power. The high priestess held a significant position, as she was regarded as the earthly wife of the deity. Interestingly, Enhinduena is recognized as the first poetess, as she eloquently depicted her life and service as a high priestess through her verses. While hymns and psalms to the gods existed before her time, it is her poems that have endured. It is worth noting that Enhinduena's pursuits extended beyond poetry. She also dedicated herself to the study of mathematics and astronomy. This is particularly remarkable because in ancient Mesopotamia, poetry and scientific studies were typically forbidden for women. Women were heavily reliant on their male relatives, subjected to the authority and protection of their fathers, husbands, brothers, or eldest sons. The societal norm dictated that a man's life was incomplete without power, while a woman's life was considered incomplete without a good husband and multiple children. Women did not possess property of their own, and adultery was punishable by death. In extreme cases, husbands could even sell their wives into slavery as a consequence of debt or disobedience. The stark differences between the lives of men and women in ancient times led women to develop their own language, or rather a distinct dialect. This women's language featured variations in pronunciation for certain sounds and incorporated words and a few vowels that were not part of the mainstream Sumerian language. Upon reaching adulthood, a Sumerian girl faced two potential paths. She could either enter into marriage or choose to become a priestess. It is important to note that these priestesses, who are unfortunately remembered in history as Babylonian whores, held significant roles in society. It is worth noting that priestesses, or Natitu, enjoyed significantly more freedom compared to married women during ancient times. Residing within monasteries, these Natitu had their own individual houses within these complexes. They had the ability to engage in contracts and conduct business transactions, activities that were strictly prohibited for ordinary women. Historical records indicate that they were highly active and involved in various endeavors. Natitu, who devoted themselves to the worship of the god Marduk, were even permitted to marry. However, it was a general rule that priestesses were not allowed to bear children. Interestingly, this is where the legendary tale of Sargon of Akkad originates. According to the legend, Sargon was believed to be the son of a priestess who was forbidden from having children. In a familiar narrative, she placed him in a wicker basket and set him adrift on the river. Enhanduena's poetic talent was not an isolated occurrence among the esteemed priestesses of Mesopotamia. In fact, this sacred order comprised an array of brilliant minds, including astronomers, mathematicians, and skilled scribes. Archaeological findings have even suggested the presence of schools near the temples within the monastic complexes, where young Natitu girls were educated in various scientific disciplines. However, the unfortunate reality is that these enlightened and independent priests of ancient Mesopotamia have been unjustly portrayed in history as Babylonian prostitutes. 
This distorted perception stems from the ideas ingrained in European culture, which have influenced the narrative surrounding these priestesses. From biblical accounts to the works of Herodotus and James Fraser, the prevailing notion has been that the primary occupation of the priestesses in ancient Babylon was temple prostitution. Nonetheless, it is important to challenge and question these misconceptions to uncover the true significance and contributions of these remarkable women. According to the prevalent belief, a distinction was made in Sumer between ordinary prostitutes and Natitu, who held the esteemed role of priestesses of love. Surprisingly, despite the strict patriarchal norms of society, these priestesses were not condemned. In fact, the high priestess herself was obligated to partake in the ritual of the holy marriage, wherein she symbolically represented the goddess by uniting with the king or priest on the marriage bed. This sacred union signified the divine marriage between heaven and earth. In smaller temples, a symbolic representation of the deity was assigned to a stranger, and it was the duty of the priestess to offer her own flesh as a sacrifice on the altar. This ritual held profound significance as it sought to magically recreate the act of creation for all living beings and ensure the continuation of life on earth. It stood as the most crucial rite within the annual cycle. However, it is important to note that priestesses of lower rank were engaged in ordinary temple prostitution. The renowned historian Herodotus recorded that, according to Babylonian customs, every woman was expected to visit the sanctuary of Aphrodite at least once in her lifetime and offer herself to a stranger. Similarly, the ancient historian Strabo mentioned the practice of temple prostitution, wherein no Babylonian woman was permitted to marry without first participating in the appropriate ritual, which involved giving herself to the first man she encountered in the temple of the goddess of love, the celestial courtesan. The process unfolded as follows. Women would enter the shrine of the goddess, donning rope harnesses upon their heads and patiently await the arrival of any stranger who would toss money into their garment and join them outside the sacred precinct. They were not allowed to refuse, and the money received was considered sacred and belonged to the goddess. A woman who had taken her place there could not return home until she had fulfilled her obligation. According to Herodotus, some women remained in the sanctuary for a period of three to four years. However, despite the extensive research conducted in recent years, no documentary evidence has been found to support the existence of temple prostitution in Mesopotamia. It is worth considering that the accounts provided by the Greeks may have been subject to misinterpretation and could potentially be describing the sacred rite of marriage instead. The term natitu, which translates to uncultivated land, does not necessarily synonymize with prostitution, even in its ritual form, as commonly believed today. In the Code of Hammurabi, this term actually defined the unique legal status of women who possessed the ability to manage property, engage in financial transactions, and enter into contracts, unlike wives and brides. Typically, these women hailed from noble backgrounds. Sumerian priestesses, in addition to their education, seemingly fulfilled ritualistic functions within their temples. Some served as scribes, meticulously inscribing cuneiform onto clay tablets. It is not surprising, then, that the Code of Hammurabi referred to a Natitu as a sister of the god or a dedicated woman. For instance, the authority of Enheduanna was held in such high regard that she assumed the position of high priestess following the passing of her father, serving under both her brother and later her nephew. Now that we have addressed the Greek historians, let us delve into the references to Babylon and the harlots of Babylon in the Bible. Undeniably, these references do not paint a flattering picture. As I mentioned earlier, Sargon of Akkad successfully united the disparate regions of Mesopotamia. However, it is crucial to note that this unification did not occur within a fragmented state, but rather among two distinct neighboring peoples. The northern Akkadians belonged to the Semitic group, while the southern Sumerians shared more similarities with the Egyptians and the inhabitants of the mid-Mediterranean coast. The ongoing conflicts between these groups persisted, primarily due to the strong influence wielded by individual city-states. Amidst this intricate tapestry of intercity rivalries, Babylon stood in the southern region. During Sargon's reign, Babylon remained a modest city. However, as time went on, it began to flourish and expand. It is plausible that in an attempt to undermine their neighbors, unflattering tales about Babylon were concocted, which later found their way into the Bible. Similarly, numerous legends surrounding the Sumerians and Akkadians likely emerged from this complex web of political dynamics and cultural biases. 
What was the underlying reason behind the stories of the Babylon whore? They say that where there's smoke, there's fire. The root cause can be traced back to Enheduanna, who extensively documented her spiritual union with the deity she worshipped. This union involved a ritualistic act accompanied by entering a trance state, possibly facilitated by special potions, but certainly not involving physical contact. It was a religious ceremony which was likely misinterpreted by ancient Greek historians who lived two millennia later. It is highly probable that viewed through the lens of time, they misunderstood certain aspects of this rite. That's all for now, if you like the story, subscribe to the channel and stay in touch.